uh, <laughs> hopefully it's the last virtual dinner meeting we have and, and pretty soon we'll be able to see each other. I guess we're face to face, but maybe a little more than face to face next time. Um, as many of you know, today is the 246th anniversary of the Mecklenburg Declaration. Uh, if anybody forgets, I think most of us know you can take a look at the flag and, and jog your memory. Um, and I know there was a celebration uptown, uh, which I know uh, a lot of people here went to. Unfortunately, I, I had a couple conflicts. And, um, you know, so in, in, in the spirit of our reverence to the Mac deck and to our community, we are very lucky to have Dr. Tom Hanchett, who is the community historian for Charlotte Mecklenburg County, and I'll introduce him in uh, just a few minutes. But before we go any further, um, let's, let's start with the invocation. And Russ, could I ask you to lead us in that, please? Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful on this day, the 20th of May, in the year of our Lord, 2021, to come together and to remember and to celebrate those forefathers who went before us and blazed a trail of liberty that we now walk. We pray, Lord, that our lives and our efforts will do honor to these heroes and may generations yet unborn benefit from what we do today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Russ. For the presentation of the colors. Bryant, do you have that for us? Present arms. Thank you. For the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Tom Flieger, could I get you to lead us in the pledge? Yes, be glad to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For the SAR pledge, Bob, Bob Ray, would you mind leading us in the SAR pledge? We, the descendants of the heroes of the American Revolution, Revolution who by the sacrifices established the United States of America, reaffirmed our faith and principles of liberty and constitutional republic, and solemnly pledge ourselves to defend the defense of the Thank you. And so to uh, to get to the main event, uh, which is Dr. Tom Hanchett, um, I, I'd just like to introduce him uh, a little bit. He, he's not just a community historian, he is the community historian for Charlotte and, and Mecklenburg County. He is best known for uh, his 16 years with the Levine Museum of the New South. He has earned degrees at Cornell, University of Chicago, UNC Chapel Hill. Pretty sure I've heard of all those. He wrote a history of Charlotte entitled Sorting Out the New South, the, I'm sorry, Sorting Out the New South City, uh, which was recently published in a new second edition 
by UNC Press. Um, and I picked that up recently and um, it's good. It's really, it, it's really interesting. I mean, a lot of us are interested in genealogies of ourselves, but I feel like we need to know the genealogy of, of where we are as well. Um, so, so anyway, Dr. Hanchett is now retired. Um, of course, he's still working. He's working on a history of affordable housing in Charlotte. Charlotte Magazine calls him Charlotte's Dr. History and honored him as Charlatine of the Year in 2015. I highly recommend that you read his writings at his website, www.historysouth.org. And I also hear he plays a pretty mean fiddle. So uh, a man of many talents. And, and today, Dr. Hanchard is gonna be telling us about the growth of the Queen City over the past 30 years, uh, in particular, uh, in the areas of education and affordable housing. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, Joe, and, and thanks to everybody. Um, I am um, very much honored to be here. And any place that uh, Tom Flager asked me to come, uh, I, will, I will come there. Um, he has done so much for Charlotte history and, and for the SAR. Uh, when he called me up, I thought he was going to maybe want me to dress up as Ben Franklin or uh, Thomas Jefferson or, you know, if we're doing recent Charlotte history, maybe I'd have to dress up as Hugh McCall. Um, I don't know. Um, but he said I could just be myself. And um, he said it was May the 20th. And I said, man, you know, um, I'm, I'm not your, your person to, to talk about Revolutionary War history of, of, of May 20th and all of that. And he said, no, no, be yourself. So, um, so that's what you're going to get. Um, and um, I, I commend the folks that were out this morning. Thank you so much for doing that. And I do believe that a, a number of us are at that dinner this evening. It is just such a, a pleasure with COVID uh, beginning to tail off that we can get together and do things again. So um, if, uh, if you're watching this later or if it's being recorded or whatever, um, thank you for, uh, for participating in, in whatever you did this day. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is get about as far from um, May 20th, 7075 as, as you can get as a historian. Um, I am um, of the conviction that history um, keeps happening and that uh, people make history, that the decisions that uh, we make day by day, when you, you're close to them, you know how important they are to you, but when you back up off of it, um, dang, things have changed. And uh, that's what I'm, I'm gonna try and talk about tonight. Let me see if I can share my screen, see if that works. And you'll, says host has disabled participant screen sharing. Joe, can you try and, and get me in there again? And I'm gonna hit that again. Nope, not quite yet. You're quite large on mine. All righty, I am now a co-host. Woo! Should be good, Tom. President of Charlotte. Cool. Now, you, you're not supposed to look at my computer tabletop here because it's a mess. But there you go. Um, I want to talk about um, the last 30 years. And um, the, the, the thing that got me to start doing this um, was uh, a group called Crew, which is Commercial Real Estate Women. And they called me up a little over a year ago and they said, we're having our 30th anniversary, would you come talk? And I, and I, I you know, what am I gonna talk about? Well, 30 years ago, uh, 1990. And um, I came to Charlotte in 1981, I'm not a Charlotte native, um, but I kind of was fortunate to leave for a few years in the 90s, that's when I went to Chapel Hill. And so I, I, I got this kind of in your face thing when I came back uh, to work for Levine Museum of the New South. And thanks to, to Crew, the Charlotte chapter of commercial real estate women, um, I, I kind of got to do it again. So what I'm, I'm gonna try and do is suggest just a few ways in which the built environment, um, urban planning, architecture, the, the, that, that built world that's around us um, has changed in 30 years. And when we're thinking about this, um, you know, any of these buildings could survive long enough so that we would consider them historic. 
And one of the things in Charlotte, Charlotte has been such a, a, a prosperous city, always growing ever since the railroads came in the 1850s, that a lot of buildings have not made it to 30 years or 40 or 50 and get torn down before that. So as you're looking at this, kind of be thinking about which ones you think might uh, make it uh, to, the, to the point where they're considered historic. And um, I, you, gotta, you gotta know that I'm not gonna cover everything by any means. And so uh, if you want, uh, get in the chat and, and add things or uh, contest things or um, ask a question or whatever. And I'm gonna try and stop um, kind of in the middle here. Um, and then um, at the end, uh, for sure to let people talk. And, and if something is just getting at you, uh, open up your microphone and, and, um, and, and let me know. Uh, that would be a, a real blessing. All righty. So what I'm going to do is first talk about some of the big changes. Um, and uh, even if, if you've lived through them, you might not be aware that in 1990, uh, we were the 15th largest city and uh, the 35th largest city in the U.S. Today, we're the 15th. Um, in this is the one that gets me, Mecklenburg County had half a million people in 1990. Uh, today, it has over a million, uh, doubled in size. And it is just amazing, you know, we're not stuck in traffic all the time uh, because so many people have come here. Uh, new newspaper article down at the left, uh, just before I, I put this together for the folks at Crew, Charlotte Growth pushes it past San Francisco. Wow. That is really something. And most of the newcomers are from the US, but for the first time, we've got a lot of folks who are immigrants. Um, 100 years ago, 120, 30 years ago, when the, the big immigrant wave came, uh, the South basically missed it. Folks went to Pittsburgh, they went to Cleveland, they went out to the big farmlands in the West. Uh, but now folks are coming here. Back then this area was so poor, you tried not to go here. Now we are a, an immigrant gateway. 1990, about 1% 1 of us were foreign born. Today, 15%, um, uh, maybe higher than that. And the last figures I have, which are now out of date, but um, Nielsen, the, the folks that measure TV and all that other stuff, they say that among the, the biggest US cities, we have been the fastest growing Latino city. Uh, about half folks coming from Latin America uh, as immigrants, the other half from all over the world. It is just amazing. Uh, and I, I live on Central Avenue. If you haven't been down there in a while, man, there are some good places to eat. You can eat your way around the world. Of course, you can't talk about Charlotte history without mentioning that we are the second biggest banking hub in the United States. Sometimes it's third, but I think this week it's second. Um, if you go back to 1990, we had two banks. We had First Union and, and what had just stopped being NCNB, North Carolina National Bank. You McCall was starting to, to, to grow that bank um, and starting to encourage legal changes so that you could buy banks outside of your state. And he named his bank Nations Bank with the notion that it, it might grow. And, and grow it did um, in uh, the 90s, uh, late 90s, it bought uh, Bank of America out in San Francisco, closed it down and constituted a new bank here with the Bank of America name. And of course, uh, 2008, uh, First Union, which had become Wachovia, um, was purchased by Wells Fargo out in San Francisco. So we got a San Francisco bank, moved it here and Wells Fargo um, got a, a Charlotte area bank and, and the headquarters is there, but there's more folks from Wells Fargo working in Charlotte uh, than there are in San Francisco. And the, the two big banks get a lot of play, but there's a, a whole lot of other financial institutions here. Bank of the Ozarks uh, um, growing, uh, particularly in the mortgage realm. And uh, you probably are aware that BB&T and SunTrust, which were both headquartered um, in the Southeast, are now together as Truist and headquartered here in Charlotte. So that, uh, that banking um, is, is what gets the headlines, but we have not a one industry town, never have been. Uh, back when uh, textiles were a big thing, we were also a railroad trading hub. Uh, today, um, you know, banking, like I say, the, the marquee uh, thing, but 
energy. Uh, we are the, the headquarters for Duke Energy. There you can see the uh, current headquarter tower. They're about to move across the street into an even newer tower. Um, Lowe's uh, started out in, in North Wilkesboro as a little community hardware store. When they got big, moved to Charlotte. Well, not literally Charlotte, they moved to Mooresville and built this whole suburban campus. Now they're building a tower in South End because if you're hip and you know people are trying to recruit you to work at Lowe's, uh, one of the first questions is, you know, are, are you living in Charlotte? Uh, wow, you know, they, they, we wouldn't have imagined that even 10 or 15 years ago. And another big employer, healthcare. By some measures, there are more folks working in healthcare than there are in any other line of work here. And if you've been around this area, you remember that in 1990, we had two hospitals, pretty much. We had um, Presbyterian, we had Charlotte Memorial, it was also Mercy was here. Um, and uh, now we've got two healthcare systems that are sprawling all over the city and in fact, all over the region. Uh, wow, and uh, you know, big changes. And all of these generate new buildings. Uh, huge investment in infrastructure, uh, the airport, obviously, uh, hub for American Airlines. Uh, you remember U.S. Airways, that went away in 2015. Uh, we are, uh, last I saw, the, I think it was this morning, yesterday morning, sixth busiest airport in the United States. And um, the Queen Charlotte statue is coming back. She's been in storage for a little bit. Um, but as they expand the terminal, she will move inside the terminal. Hard to believe that that statue was a, a new thing back in 1990. Infrastructure, you got to talk about highways. Um, 485. 45 in 1990 was just getting started. I think the, the bulldozers were out working on the uh, piece down there by uh, what became Ballantyne. And now you can go all the way around there and you can run into traffic at almost any hour of the day, which is, um, I think people are still shocked that, uh, that that's the way it is that far out of town. Um, a counteracting uh, effort with that, of course, is the Lynx, the light rail, which started in 2007. And the piece that you're looking out there going up to UNC Charlotte, um, that happened in 2018 and we're now testing uh, the Lynx Gold Line, the, the streetcar that will connect the, the Johnson C. Smith area with, with my area along Central Avenue. And they're working on a silver line. that will go out to uh, Union County on one end and Gaston County on the other. So um, coming to big city. Uh, new destinations. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to, how to group some of these big changes. And of course, People talk about professional sports teams here. We, we often had minor league stuff, but now uh, we have major league places to go enjoy sports. The Panthers Stadium dating from 1996, the Hornets Basketball Arena downtown from 2005, and the beautiful Knights Baseball Stadium, uh, which is uh, reopening now with that sunset view of the skyline. Other kinds of new destinations. Um, in 1990, uh, Concord Mills Mall did not exist. Um, out east of town, uh, one of the, the busiest destinations in the south. North Lake Mall did not exist up north of town. Uh, the Whitewater Center, uh, people laughed when uh, they're talking about putting in a concrete river. Would folks ever go way out of the edge of the city and, and, and go look at a concrete river? And they did. Uh, that Whitewater Center has, has put us on um, recreation and sports maps that, that I didn't even know existed. Downtown, um, retail coming back, at least in a small way, uh, the epicenter development in 2010. And I could point to a lot of others as well. Entire edge cities. Ballantyne, I mentioned Ballantyne. Uh, Johnny Harris and Smokey Bissell um, getting that started in the 1990s, it seemed so far out of town. Uh, I can remember when they built the, the shopping village kind of in the middle of it, the Ballantyne Village shopping area with the, um, the movie theater that's way up in the sky there. You look back and see the Charlotte skyline, uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, I go out there every once in a while, I, I play music at, at one of the wine bars out there that has an open mic. And uh, I got lost uh, the other time and I ended up in Blakeney. I didn't even know there was a Blakeney 
Um, it is a, a pretty much entirely new community, um, as big as Ballantyne, um, out there, um, out on the other side of 485. And in the center city, we are one of the, I keep telling this to people and nobody's really pushed back. We are one of the healthiest center cities. A lot of cities go to Atlanta and, and the center city is kind of kind of gasping for air because so much new development was built out at the edge of town. Um, here, we've got edge, edge city development, but at the center, that's where you know, the sports facilities and a lot of the big employers are, are focusing on the center city. And it is, um, it is just amazing to watch the skyline change. The top is a photograph uh, looking down at the Cameron Brown building. Can you see that black and white building in the foreground there? Um, that was a big deal when I came to Charlotte. Look at the lower right here. A friend of mine has a drone, got up and shot this. Uh, and, and most of those buildings did not exist in 1990. So um, talk about change. We got it going on. So with that, let me, let me just take a break. And I can't see the chat. Joe, is there anything in the chat I should respond to? Or uh, folks just want to open your microphone and, and um, add something to this, talk about how you've been involved in this, um, things I missed? I'd ask a question um, if, if uh, nobody else, uh, well, I'll just ask since I'm presiding officer. Um, in terms of the, uh, um, you know, the effect that all this development and construction um, had just on people's day-to-day -day lives, um, I mean, it, it, it seems like it would have had, I mean, it did have a big effect on people. Um, but just that sort of urbanization uh, compared to, you know, in, in a relatively quick uh, time span, just sort of what, what you think some of the biggest effects were on people. Well, I would be interested in hearing uh, what other folks say. I, I know that on one hand, um, I've lived in cities that weren't growing. I lived in Youngstown, Ohio. And um, boy, that was a hard place to live. It was hard to, to, to launch any kind of new idea. It was hard to, to get people involved in things because it, it, it just, there was no multiplier effect. You know, things were not gonna get any better um, in a big way because the whole town was decreasing. Uh, here in Charlotte, um, you know, we have a lot of new people. And in some ways that's really good. There's a lot of places to eat. There's a lot of things going on that weren't going on in 1990, but it can also be really disorienting. Uh, particularly if you grew up here, you can feel like a stranger in your own town. And so things that the SAR does to kind of pull together communities, I think, I think that is you know, commendable as history, but it's also commendable as community building. How about other folks? What do you think about all this growth? Tom, how about addressing the uh, the entertainment that we we built here? I remember when we got here, there was an article in the paper. This fellow wrote an article about how you couldn't buy a Snicker bar downtown after five o'clock. Literally, the place emptied out, and there was very little entertainment anywhere in the city. And of course, to now, you and I, you know, know folk society and other things like that. It is mushroom. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, if you're just coming here, um, it used to be you could go down on a Sunday afternoon in the, in the center city um, or, golly, you know, a Friday night at 11 and um, you know, lie down in the street. And nobody would even notice because there was nobody there. Uh, <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. But um, the, 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 the transformation and the, the liveliness um, is just really impressive. And in the center city, it was things like the Blumenthal Performing Arts Center, Spirit Square, which was really the first notion that people would voluntarily come down uh, in the 70s, that got started. Um, all the museums, Levine Museum of the New South and the, the Beckler Center and uh, uh, you know, all, all of those kind of places. Um, and um, you know, banjo players and fiddle players like you and me uh, with Charlotte Folk Society, which got started um, in the 80s. And so um, the, the, the becoming a big city um, 
on balance, I kind of like it. Hey, do you have any idea what is going to happen to the old theater that's uh, down on North Trine Street? It's been closed for years. The Carolina Theater is currently being renovated, and that is oh. definitely going to happen uh, unless the economy changes in a way that I cannot imagine. Uh, Foundation for the Carolinas um, bought it, and they have raised $30 million, a bunch of million dollars, to um, turn the, the, the theater part into a, not a performing arts center, because we got one of those already, but for a place with, where you know, a speaker comes to, to talk about revolutionary war history or um, you know, a, a solo performer um, to have a, a, a space that, that brings us together around things like that. Um, and they will, the, the old facade of the old theater has been in storage and they're reassembling that as part of the lobby. It's gonna be really cool. Um, they also had um, somebody who was gonna build a hotel sitting on top of that new lobby. And that's on hold because of the, the way the economy has gotten weird the last year. But uh, Carolina Theater, I don't, I don't know what the completion date is, but go downtown and, and they're working on it. There's a question. Um, would you please weigh in on the possible effects on growth that will come about uh, from the city council's proposal to eliminate single family housing zoning and to eliminate uptown towers uh, to 30 stories or less? And, and with that, I'm, I'm a historian, so I can tell you what has happened but I'm not good at telling you what will happen. Um, the, um, I, I can kind of summarize what I think is at play in terms of the, the zoning thing. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I looked at in, in my history book is how we got into the kind of zoning that we have. And here and, and most other places, zoning was really a tool of exclusion. It was a, something that was intended to, to keep that stuff over there and, and our stuff over here. And we have um, begun to question whether that amount of separation is really needed. Um, and so uh, that, that's, that's what's at play. Um, Victoria Watlington, who's an African-American city council person serves the West side, um, is one of the people who says that ending single family zoning may not have the notion, may not have the effect of encouraging you know, more diverse building in neighborhoods, which I think would be a good thing. Um, it's something historically that took place in my neighborhood of Plaza Midwood, Elizabeth, even Myers Park, there are duplexes and quadruplexes and wouldn't that be cool again? But what's going on right now in terms of um, development pressure is that we have a lot of speculators that are looking up to buy up anything anywhere. I mean, go look at the, the teardowns, every part of this city, it's amazing. And she worries that, um, that changing that zoning would make the teardowns even more attractive. And uh, like I say, I'm a historian, I, I, I can't weigh in on that well, uh, but it's, it's fascinating to, to watch people talk about you know, big ideas like that. I think we're making history right now. Hey, Tom, I, I was um, an architecture student back in the 1960s and 70s and had a sister that lived down in Charlotte and was acutely aware when I would come visit here of the influence of the city fathers, specifically Hugh McCall and uh, John Belk and Eddie Crutchfield and the interest they had in preserving the downtown and the creation of the Downtown Development Authority within uh, what Nations Bank at the time and Hugh McCall and right. Fourth Ward and you know then the different wards and so much of the money the, of the banks went into the downtown uh, the Overstreet Mall uh, new architectural concepts, you know, and uh, I, I'd like to hear you comment on the influence. Uh, this was a little bit before your time in Charlotte, but uh, didn't that have a dramatic effect on shaping the downtown of Charlotte and, 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 and bringing it about to be what it is today that we know? Yeah, um, the, the vision that you, McCall, and um, his contemporaries had and their ability to work together, uh, even people in, in rival institutions would, would get together and, and say, you know, we need a football team, or um, we really need to respond to this call for desegregation with something meaningful, or uh, you know, whatever. 
And um, I, I think that really did help Charlotte. Um, and um, McCall, of course, is still doing that work this day. Um, but one of the things that, um, as a historian looking at the big picture, uh, we don't have hometown corporate institutions anymore. Uh, the way that we did even in the 90s, um, you know, Nations Bank, for all of its name, basically served a radius in the Carolinas when it got started. And the executives lived here. And so when it was going to, 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 to you know, push for a better world, it pushed for a better world right here. Um, currently, Bank of America, wonderful institution. Um, most of its top executives don't live in Charlotte. And they rightly feel that their responsibility is to a, a national footprint. And so it's just, it's just really harder to get the traction to, to, to do um, unexpected things um, that you can see. One of the things that I, I'm working on in the history of affordable housing in Charlotte, there's a lot of affordable housing built into the center city. And you'd never know it because it was done so well. Uh, come in on uh, Trade Street off of uh, 77 and, and one of the first complexes you see is a, a, a mix of affordable housing and market rate housing. Come in from my side of town up 7th Street, one of the first complexes you see is a mix of affordable housing. And, and, and so um, I'm, I'm just fascinated by that period that you're talking about. Bob, could you address, uh, for example, the, the, the immigrants, if you take a trip out Central Avenue, how many nationalities you're gonna see. It's literally a, a little United Nations out there. Yeah. And, and it's not just um, Central Avenue, I'm partial to Central Avenue. Um, I, I really love the uh, Bosnian sausage sandwich place that's uh, right up the street from uh, uh, where you can get the Chinese dim sum. And um, <clears throat> I just love that. But um, if you go out uh, Polk Street in Pineville, there's the same kind of mixing. If you go up Mallard Creek Road, uh, up north of UNCC, there's the same kind of mixing. And um, I, I, you know, we, we talk about trying to build a city that brings people together and looking up close at the way the immigrants have, have, have fitted in and provided um, you know, new businesses. I, I live around the corner from Nova Bakery, which was the first place you could get European style bread. Um, it's it's a fascinating to watch that. I, I'm old enough to remember when there were white and colored signs at the train station, at the water fountain. And uh, how many how many different signs and how many water fountains would you need uh, with with this global world that we're now part of? Uh, are there any criteria to uh, declare a building historic in Charlotte? Is there any sort of a city? designation? There are two kinds of designation. Both of them look at, at kind of 50 years. Does the, the building or the landscape kind of look like it did 50 years ago? I'm, I'm simplifying, but you know, use that as a rule of thumb. There's National Register, um, and we have uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of buildings here on the National Register of Historic Places, which does not keep the owner from doing anything. The National Register was set up when they were doing urban renewal and highway building, and they just screwed up and tore down a lot of stuff they shouldn't have, particularly Revolutionary War uh, neighborhoods up in New England. And, uh, and so they created this list. Uh, but the, the thing that has some teeth in it is local historic designation, uh, districts like Plaza Midwood where I live or individual landmarks like the Carolina Theater. Um, and with that, um, there is a, a process to help uh, a property owner do renovations. If they need to do renovations, they're going to fit in. Neighbors have some comment on that. Um, and uh, in return, there's a, a property tax break. Um, but it doesn't have the kind of teeth that it would have in Boston, for instance. In Boston, if it's landmark, you can't tear it down. Here, the way our, our state legislature set it up, uh, there's a one-year waiting period, but then you can tear it down. And uh, we see that happening fairly frequently in Charlotte. If you remember the old Masonic temple in the center city, uh, that's an example of that. Well, let me, uh, let me do, we, do we still have uh, five, 10 minutes or are we pretty much out of time? No, please, if you've, if you've got okay. more, that'd be great. Well, let me, I, I, I said I was gonna talk a little bit about women 
because uh, I did this originally for the uh, commercial real estate women. And I, I wanted to, to talk about, um, and again, this is kind of me taking stock, stuff I hadn't noticed because I'm too close to it. Um, the way that uh, women are leading in our educational institutions, which is about education, but it's also about building new buildings. Um, I'm going to talk about something called placemaking, uh, parks, all sorts of stuff like that, and then this affordable housing thing. And I'll just go through these real quick, but um, it is really impressive that um, Charlotte Mecklenburg School Board, uh, there is one male representative. Uh, it took forever for there to be more than one or two female representatives. Now maybe we've tilted too much the other way. But CMS, all these folks moving in, CMS uh, passes a bond issue every few years. We're pleading the 2017 bond issue, 17 new schools. Pretty much a school or two schools a year. Um, and uh, it's, it's just amazing. Um, when you look at higher education, of course, uh, Bonnie Cohn uh, was the person who founded UNC Charlotte. They would not make her a, a, a chancellor because she was a woman. Today, UNC Charlotte has its first female chancellor. Uh, Johnson C. Smith, Queens University, uh, had longtime female chancellors, but only in the last few years. And uh, today, up at Davidson College, a uh, liberal arts college for young men, not that long ago, Carol Quillen is busy building new buildings. She's the new president. Uh, Johnson and Wales University has a female president. And CPCC, which in 1990 had one campus, now has campuses all over the county. And a woman named Candy Dietemeyer is the president. So, um, you know, wow, talk about historic change. And um, placemaking, what do I mean by placemaking? Charlotte is finally getting serious about building parks. And I love the Romar Bearden Park. I hope you all have been there in the center city. I love the little Sugar Creek Greenway. Uh, the team that put that together was Gwen Cook at Park and Recreation and a firm here in Charlotte called Land Design. And Beth Poovey uh, was the point person. Uh, when I came to Charlotte in 1981, I was trained as an architectural historian. I knew some of the first women in these kinds of positions. And now they're, they're, they're shaping our city. Um, Ann Springs Close, um, very well-to-do uh, part of the, the, the textile families in um, Fort Mill, Lancaster, um, is uh, at the forefront nationally in terms of envisioning greenways, the Ann Springs Close Greenway that's on her family land. But also she was a driving force in the Carolina Thread Trail. Uh, Ruth Shaw was the first CEO managing its board, uh, head of Duke Energy, doggone it. And, and the idea with the Carolina Thread Trail, I'm sure you know, is to knit together all these different greenways that are springing up so that we have a, a network that crosses county boundaries. So women uh, changing the way that we experience the built world, the natural world. Uh, out at University City, I can, I can remember when that was nothing. Um, and then there was a couple of shopping centers out there. And, um, and now they're trying to glue that area together as a walkable destination. And a woman is running that, a woman named Darlene Heater. So uh, leading in education, uh, there's this new thing that I'm calling placemaking. And then let me just delve into the affordable housing situation for a moment. Uh, I think you remember the, the tent city that popped up uh, last year, um, homeless folks um, along uh, I-277 downtown. That was not just Charlotte. Um, I, I just read a thing that those tent cities are pretty much nationwide. Um, and we haven't seen anything like that since the Great Depression. And so in, in why and how to cope with it, I'm still trying to get my arms around. But I notice that the folks who are at the forefront of that, uh, many of them are, are female leaders. Uh, Mayor Vi Lyles and her chief of staff who are raising money, particularly for the Affordable Housing Fund. Um, Carol Hardison, who is helping people stay out of tent cities. Uh, the uh, Crisis Assistance Ministry you know, gives you a loan or, or helps you with clothes or food or whatever so you can stay 
in your apartment. Um, and um, if you become homeless, uh, the old men's shelter is now roof above. And they're working to create situations in which there is enough housing for people at very low income um, so that we don't have more tent cities. Um, amazing thing that, that, she, that uh, Liz Clausen Kelly just told me, uh, I was at a church service with her the other day and she was speaking and she said that at the men's shelter, uh, more than half the folks who are there on a given night are working full time and they don't have enough money for housing. I hear a question or comment. Did I hear somebody saying something? I get on a roll and I don't want to roll over anybody. Sorry, Tom, I think I was talking to my little one. Oh, that's a good thing, that's a good thing. Um, we are a, a national leader in what's called supportive housing. Folks who might be chronically homeless because they have a, a mental health issue or whatever, can we get them into housing and, and then help them deal with whatever their problem is? There's a woman named Kathy Izzard um, who wrote this book called 100 Story Home about Moore Place and McCresh Place in Charlotte, which are um, national models of how to you know, give people housing, uh, get them off the street, get them out of the tent camps, and then help them deal with whatever demons are, are nipping at their heels. And um, people are building lots of new affordable housing. Uh, we have had more housing, affordable housing approved in the last 12 months than um, in any comparable era that I know. Um, and again, women leading that. I particularly uh, admire Kirsten Sickley, uh, the old YWCA, still the YWCA down by Park Road Shopping Center. You can walk to Park Road Shopping Center. Uh, they had um, you know, for rent rooms from the old YWCA model. They said, we're gonna, we're gonna help women who would be homeless, not be homeless. And then they had a lot of room around their building and they said, we're gonna build affordable housing. And they've built some up behind and they're building it in front right now. So that folks who you know, have a job at Park Road Shopping Center, but are not making enough to rent a market rate place, uh, have a place to, place to stay. And uh, talk about national, part, uh, national models. Um, what's now Dream Key Partners was originally Charlotte Housing Partnership and uh, they have uh, done a lot of new housing construction, uh, not government owned public housing, but housing owned by this uh, nonprofit. Uh, what we're looking at is Brightwalk, uh, which uh, started out by building affordable apartment units. Uh, there had been a, a rundown apartment complex there, moved folks out, paid their rent, and then moved them back into the affordable housing. And I'm got sun in my eyes. I hope I apologize for looking weird here. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and around that, they built market rate housing, townhouses, single family homes. And would people ever buy a house next to affordable housing? Well, yes, they would. And that's, it's remarkable. The housing values for profit, uh, for market rate um, housing is going up. Um, in uh, the Bright Walk area on Statesville Avenue. So um, talk about making history. Um, we're kind of doing that here in Charlotte when it comes to, to all these different ways of you know, creating the built environment. I'd, I'd be curious uh, how you react to this, whether you think some of this will come to be considered historic. And I'll stop there. Questions, comments, predictions? So, Tom, I've got a question. I uh, came down here from the Boston area, and cool. uh, we're we're blown away. So we're in Mooresville. I've got cows in my backyard, a lake a short walk away, and I can be in Uptown, which I'm still getting used to saying, uh, in about you know 36 minutes. Um, have you started to look? you know, further out from the city borders and get a feel of what's changing there? Because you talk to anyone who's been in Mooresville for 10 years and working or going to Charlotte is just, man, I might as well head to Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have been invited up to give some uh, history talks in Mooresville. 
where I spent a lot of time listening. And there is a, a, a sense, a real divide there between uh, new well-to-do folks who are mostly living on the lake side of I-77 and the, the older folks who are mostly living around the historic part of the town um, on the west side. Nope, I'm getting west and east mixed up. The west side is where uh, the lake is. Uh, the east side is where the old downtown Mooresville is. Um, and it's interesting seeing them try to try to work together to create a city that they're all comfortable with. Um, that, that's the, the depth of my um, observation. What are you seeing up there? Well, I'll put a plug in. Uh, I've recently joined the Mooresville Diversity and Inclusion Task Force um, that's been put together to kind of address those um, things that you just touched on. And uh, man, we might love to, to have you kind of speak to us about what you've seen in Charlotte, because I think, especially coming from the Northeast, uh, I lived in Bedford, New Hampshire, which is basically North Boston now, yet it's 50 miles outside the city. And um, I, I can see that happening a bit, the creep up 77. And there's a lot of people that just haven't seen that in their lives down here. So I think there's all that... Uh, angst that comes with it when you see the c city coming north and I'm like oh in 15 years you're going to be you're going to be really uncomfortable yeah yeah thank you for that I Anyone feel like one of the things uh, sorry go ahead go ahead Joe I'm sorry oh I, I was just going to make a comment that it seems like to me what people people are okay with change, people are okay with slow change, but the more rapid it is, the more people are are going to have a problem with it. Um, and so I wonder. I don't have any particular opinion uh, myself, but does it does it seem like it's something that um, that that does wind up being sort of divisive for people with all the, whether it's affordable housing or just development in general, which there's, you know, a lot of both going on. Yeah. Well, um, the, the presenting of the colors um, in uh, your, um, by the way, the way you guys are running this and, and keeping it lively and bringing in video and um, you guys are really good. Um, COVID, COVID has given us a chance to, to learn new skills, or at least give you a chance. I really appreciate that. But the, um, the presenting of the colors, was that at Steel Creek Presbyterian Church? Am I, am I remembering correctly? Yes. Yeah. And, and Steel Creek Presbyterian Church is about to be decommissioned because the airport is expanding and swallowing up everything out there. Uh, folks who are uh, my age or older can remember when that was a, a rural community around a country store known as the Dixie community. And they're, they're, I, I know, I play music with uh, um, old doggone, wonderful woman who, who grew up out there and uh, still mourning um, the, the, the world of her her youth that's that's gone. And so I think a lot of us are uh, like you say, Joe, I mean, just dealing with this whiplash of change. Hey, Tom, I've got a, a question, and it's, it's kind of a, a, a broad sweep of history type question, but, uh, you know, cities existed uh, initially because people came together downtown to get to, you know, rub shoulders and, and transact and do business. Now with uh, the automobile, of course, that's had a centrifugal force on all of our cities and made them so dispersed and so you've got Atlanta, Atlanta, which is a really a, a, a system of uh, suburban uh, cities. Not so much a bunch of shopping malls looking for a city. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, and then and then inf 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 telecommunications technology, which has allowed us all to uh, you know work in wherever we want to work. But now with the COVID situation, where for uh, a year or so, uh, so many people have been working at home. And uh, businesses have found that it uh, really doesn't hurt the bottom line so much to have people working at home. What effect is all this going to have on cities like Charlotte, who have managed over time to maintain a, a central focus uh, against all these uh, centrip centripetal forces that uh, uh, centrifugal forces that are, are pulling us apart? And do you see that having a detrimental effect on 
cities like Charlotte? That, that is a billion dollar question. And it's not just Charlotte. I mean, anybody that's in commercial real estate uh, or is making decisions about um, you know, where to place any location of anything is, is trying to figure that out. So you know, I, I, I ain't gonna be a good predictor, but I, I have noticed, well, let me ask you guys, um, do you wanna get together with people again? Most of us really do. Not all of us, but most of us really want to get together with people again. And I, I think that's something that I, I've learned this last year. I would consider myself an introvert, even though I'm, I'm good at, at talking to, you know, the assembled multitude here. Um, I, I really thought I was an introvert until this last year, where I realized I really need to be around people. And... Um, as, as uh, Governor Cooper's um, mandates have changed in the last week or so, if you've been out recently, dang, you know, people are out and there's, there's this, this like this bubbling excitement. And the place where people are, where people are, a lot of them is places like South End uh, or the, the breweries in Plaza Midwood or you know, any place where people can come together and wander and buy a little something and be a social being. Humans are wired to be social beings, I think. And so mm -hmm. if I had to predict, which as a historian, I don't, but I will, um, I think our cities are gonna do okay. But that's, that's the, uh, the model of the English pub. You know, you can have a pub in every little community uh, all over suburbia, and, and, and that's, that fulfills that uh, need to get together and, and converse and rub shoulders. Uh, but does that bring together and maintain central focus of cities like Charlotte and Boston and the other cities that in the past have re really relied on rail systems to uh, keep them focused uh, at a nexus uh, and, 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 you know, that, that way. Uh, we don't have that in Charlotte. We don't have a yeah. rail system. I mean, we've got a, a token rail system with the, yeah. the link and the- Well, it's interesting that the, the place where uh, people in their 20s are mostly hanging out is kind of along the rail system. Um, you don't see vast crowds of, of young people at South Park Mall, as fine as it is. But uh, when, when people, you know, want to be in a in a exciting place, um, they're uh, you know in South End or they're at Optimist Hall, the old textile mill. It's on the um, light rail going north. Um, those those kind of casual coming together places. And those are um, people that live in those areas, areas, right? They live in those areas. I, I, I live out by the Arboretum, and there's a British couple that lives just down the street from me. And every Saturday night, they go over to the Arboretum and catch the bus, go downtown and do bar hopping. But they're Englishmen, you know, that's what they expect to do. Uh, wow. you know, and that fulfills a need in their lives. <laughs> wow. Well, I like, I like what you're observing and I like the questions you're asking. And um, that's, that's going to be interesting to see that as history unfolds. There's another question um, that someone uh, wrote. Is there any effort to protect, maybe it's sort of in the same vein, um, to protect or restore or preserve um, any of the, you know, agrarian agricultural past of Charlotte that drove the economy 50 or 60 years ago? Um, and if there is, do you know where it is? <laughs> um, let me start out pessimistically. No, there's not. Um, and then let me back off of that. Um, the, the efforts to do greenways um, is pretty impressive. There's a, a plan for a cross Charlotte trail. Um, we put our bikes in the car quite frequently and go down to um, a, a bunch of trails that wander kind of along Highway 51 uh, in the south part of the county. There's, there's a lot of rural swamps and uh, stream beds and stuff that, that you can follow. Um, the deer follow them. Uh, there are, are deer up in my neighborhood in the center city because we've got this kind of some formal but a lot of informal linked green spaces in our city. Um, and I think we're becoming intel intentional about doing something to, to make sure they're around. 
In terms of just flat out farmland, no. Um, about 30 years ago, uh, when I was just coming to Charlotte, Dan Morrill with the Historic Landmarks Commission said, you know, guys, they just put a big water main up into North Mecklenburg. If you don't do something right now, North Mecklenburg is going to look like New Jersey. And um, it doesn't look exactly like New Jersey, but it looks a lot more like New Jersey now than it does like the farmland I remember. And uh, Tim and Genevieve Keller, why do I remember their names? They, were, they wrote this proposal, put it up in front of the county commission, and the county commission said, you want to do what? So uh, folks out in Mooresville, I think there's still time to do something up that way, um, or maybe the next level out. Well, Tom, I, I live in Huntersville, and the thing that, uh, that offends me the most about this, our growth is that the real estate developers come in and they scalp the land, take it all the way down to, to clay, take out all the trees, and, and then build roads and then and put trees back. But of course, they, they can't ever replace the, the pines and the oaks that they tore out of there. And, and I see this all, everywhere. And unfortunately, with all the new growth out here, we still have two lane roads. So, yep. yeah. Well observed. Yep. Well observed. We shall see. One of the things that I, I always tell people is that um, what we're learning is that, um, and this is hard to grasp for me, but in order to have the kind of community we want to live in in the next 10 years, we have to tax ourselves now to build that stuff. Yes. You know, the people, a lot of the people who are going to use it aren't here yet. And um, another way to put it is that when I moved to Mecklenburg County 40 years ago this, this week, um, no one said, Tom, why don't you send a letter? Let people know you're coming and, and put a check in the letter. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, we don't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty amazed we're not stuck in traffic all the time. So um, it, it's, uh, but it's, uh, it, we're, we're, we're scrambling to. We're going to get there. Say again, sir. So I'm saying we're going. We're going to get there. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. I came from Los Angeles three years ago. Uh, you ain't seen anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I will um, say that. Um, Let's see, early 90s, which is almost 30 years ago, I spent a year uh, going to Emory University. I had a, a fellowship uh, after I finished at Chapel Hill. And um, yeah, 30 years ago in Atlanta, you were literally always stuck in traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no time of the day when you had didn't have to wait multiple turns at a stoplight. And people said, well, Charlotte's gonna be like Atlanta in just a couple of years. Most of Charlotte is still not as choked up as Atlanta was 30 years ago. So um, it, it, as much as, um, you know, if I was in charge, I would, I would do better. But we're kind of doing pretty good at, um, at keeping ahead a little bit anyway on the infrastructure in a way that Atlanta isn't. Well, Tom, one of the things that helped Atlanta was the invention of the ring road. And, and now that we have 485, uh, that, that does take uh, a lot of the traffic that, that used to have to go downtown, go through yep. the city, yep. uh, like 77 does now, yep. uh, to, uh, uh, it helps eliminate that problem. Hey, Tom, I, I understand that you, uh, you, you, you're a town planning historian, and no doubt you've studied the, the, the difference between the English townscape, town planning, and American uh, townscape planning. Now we're the sons of the American Revolution and we revolted against the king and we have all these rights in this country that uh, in England uh, they, don't, they don't have with respect to their land. And I would like your comments on your contrast between uh, English town planning and American town planning with respect to the, uh, the laws that pertain to such. Do you see that there's an effect there uh, that we Americans have in some 
in some sense, uh, you know, inflicted on ourselves with our, our, our freedom of, of land use and so forth. That, I, I think you said it uh, probably better than I can. Um, one thing that exists in uh, English town planning that was imposed, literally imposed, uh, right after World War II. Right after World War II, we put in place things like the FHA, where you could get a mortgage to, to build a new thing, and we did accelerated depreciation, which helps the shopping centers. And, and we did all of these things to, which weren't free market. They were subsidizing <laughs> growth. We love growth. But in England, what they did is they put in uh, growth boundaries. And they said, you know, if it's now a farmer's field, you got to jump through lots of hoops to go out and build something there. And, um, you know, fly to England, if you can, rent a car or a bicycle or get on the train and go to, um, you know, a small town or even a big city and you can walk from the center city to farmer's fields. And uh, the, the city itself is very compact, but very humane because it's, it's all kind of like a giant pub. You know, people close to each other figuring out how to enjoy each other. Um, and then you get out a little ways and um, by and large, there aren't you know, a bunch of Walmarts and McDonald's that actually now have a few Walmarts. But, um, and, and so, yeah, uh, it, isn't that kind of strange that um, you know, we, we made a different set of choices because of this revolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's right. Uh, one, one professor explained it to me once back in the 1960s he said, in England, you know, the king owned on the land. Uh, in France, the king owned on the land. You, you didn't get to do what you wanted to do with your land. In this country, everybody had his own acre, or his own 40 acres, or his own half, you know, and we did what we wanted to with our land. And that's great in many respects, but we, we pay the price when we start talking about uh, the aesthetics of the environment. In some sense, do we not? I love that. Yeah. Well, this is a great discussion. We've, we've come up on, on eight o'clock and um, I'm supposed to have quit long before this. So let me um, thank you all for, um, for uh, making me think this evening. And let me turn it back over to Joe. Hey, thank you, Dr. Hanson. This, this, really uh, this has really been great. It's a good discussion too. Um, we really appreciate it. Appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, spend the evening with us on May 20th. Uh, this, you know, to, to talk about like this snapshot in time in our city and in, in the landscape of our city kind of makes me think that there's always like there's always big changes going on every generation, not just, you know, well, we're here about one big one 250 or so years ago, but there's big changes going on. Uh, all the time. And I guess if we stay aware of all these changes like we talked about today, um, specifically where we live, then we can stay connected um, to the place that we live and to each other. And if I can bring that back to the Mac deck, um, you know, it's important because in the Mac deck, they swore an oath, not just, not just a national oath, but a connection to each other, to their, to their community here in Mecklenburg County, um, to each other, their lives, you know, their fortunes, their honor. Um, and, and I like that. I like that community pledge. I would say at least as much as I like the national pledge. Um, so anyway, we all have history and, and, and we're living in it. Uh, even if now we've got a ring road. So uh, um, for the recessional, um, Brian, do you mind bringing up the recessional? And Greg, maybe I can call on you uh, to take us through that if you don't mind. Certainly. Gentlemen, until we meet again, again. Let us remember our obligations to our forefathers who gave us a constitution, our constitution, the Bill of Rights, an independent Supreme Court, and a nation of Supreme Court. Thank you. And for our benediction, Russ, would you lead us in that, please? 
Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this evening and these opportunities to reflect on our past and on our present and on our future. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that our forefathers gave to us. We are thankful, Father, for the stand that so many took on this day so many years ago, and may we be worthy of their sacrifice. Father, we pray that as sons of the American Revolution, we will be stewards of the land and of our time and of our talents to better serve our families now and in the future. May we understand that dominion is stewardship and one day someone else will have the opportunities that we have today. Thank you for Tom and for his presentation and for all of our members here assembled. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 And with that, uh, this meeting is officially adjourned. Thanks, everybody.